Hello everyone. I'm excited to welcome you to Live Healthy Naturally, where we flip the dialogue about health and wellness in terms of what your body can do on its own and your ability to heal from many so-called lifelong diseases. I'm your host, Dr. Sandra Shridharan. I'm an naturopathic doctor practicing out of Dallas, Texas. And I'm also the founder of Hygia Homeopathy and Hygia Holistic Retreat. Are you ready to hear the stories of healing and the many journeys of people healing from autism, autoimmune conditions, and many more? Then, listen on. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me on this brand new episode of Live Healthy Naturally. And I'm Dr. Samya Shridharan. And here today with me, I have an amazing guest, lots of amazing information that you're going to hear about your oral health. You know, there are so many aspects to holistic health. I have seen patients who have had liver failure as a result of their teeth. And I know a lot of people don't think of these kinds of things. And also, even breast cancer, there is a big component of oral health contributing to either, you know, the good health of your breast or diseases of your breast. And most people don't know this aspect of it. And another aspect also that I would like to mention before I go on to interviewing my guest is thyroid diseases. This is another area where dental health, I mean, every aspect of your body matters and every aspect of your body is connected to your dental health and oral health. But specifically, these kinds of diseases are some things that I have seen just by doing fluoride in a dental practice can contribute to hypothyroidism. So, so many people go, I'm sure you are going to the dentist often and going and getting your oral cleaning done, your dental cleaning done, and then six months later, you go back and do all of this all over again, yet you don't necessarily have really healthy teeth. Maybe you keep getting cavities, maybe your children are getting cavities, and nobody ever tells you how to prevent them. And that isn't necessarily how any kind of healthcare should be. Healthcare should really be preventative, isn't it? So that's the reason why we have this wonderful Dr. Tony Ingram from Flourish Dental Boutique and in Richardson. And I have had so many patients go to her and every single patient of mine loves, loves, loves her and her practice because she is such an advocate for your health. Because everything that goes in your mouth obviously goes into your body. And if your dentist is not on the same page as your naturopathic physician or your holistic doctor or your integrative medical doctor or functional medical doctor, then you really are doing a disservice to yourself. And so she is going to give us lots of pearls of wisdom so you can take that away and uh, get your own oral health and your physical health in order. Thank you so much for joining Dr. Ingram. I really appreciate you being here and willing to share your knowledge, your wonderful, you know, sweet presence on our podcast. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. I can't wait to dig in and get talking about this stuff. Yes. <laughs> so we'll also share her information, you know, on our description. So if whenever you are ready to take care of your oral health as well as your whole body health, then you can definitely reach out to their office. I highly, highly, highly recommend Dr. Ingram and her practice because she has done wonders for every single patient of mine that I've sent her way. So for beginners, Dr. Ingram, tell us a little bit about why holistic dentistry. Like, What is this whole thing and how did you get into this? There are so many dentists on every corner of every street. So what makes this different and how did you even think about this whole concept? Well, to start, holistic dentistry has several names, so it's kind of confusing. A lot of people refer to it, and most of us refer to it as biological dentistry, mm -hmm. but holistic is really a better descriptor because it's just that. Yes, we specialize in the mouth, but we take into consideration the entire person. It really is holistic care, just like you're treating so holistically. It's holistic care. So biological dentistry or holistic dentistry, a lot of it is really very similar to 
traditional dentistry in the what we do because we still do fillings, we still do crowns, we still clean teeth, but the difference lies in the how and the why and even the when. Mm -hmm. The when, meaning we try to be very, very preventive. So Mm -hmm. diet always comes first, lifestyle always comes first. Mm -hmm. And if we can prevent dentistry from needing to happen, then that's a win in our book. The how is we're much more mindful with the materials that we use. Mm -hmm. In my practice, I believe dentistry should be safe. Mm -hmm. And with that, that means I feel like in the past, dentistry has not always been Mm -hmm. safe. Mm -hmm. And so we're very careful to source the materials that we use mindfully Not that everything that we use is natural and organic. You know, sometimes a a filling is a filling and that that's not something that's a natural product, but we make sure that we're using products and materials that are as safe and as natural as possible to get done what we need to get done. Mm -hmm. That's really the basis of it. I'm sure a lot of your listeners know the difference between germ theory and terrain theory. Correct. And we believe that both exist, Mm -hmm. but it's not just germ theory. It's really taking into consideration the terrain Mm -hmm. of the entire person. Mm -hmm. You know, one person might respond to an amalgam filling, a silver filling differently than another person Mm -hmm. because of the toxic burden that their terrain is already having to deal with. Mm -hmm. So so those are, Mm -hmm. that's just kind of the high level difference between normal dentistry and holistic or biological dentistry. So I do want to interject that the terrain theory and germ theory, just so we clarify, you know, for our listeners, is terrain theory is the concept of your body is really what, where everything happens. So if you keep the body healthy and the defenses strong, then germs can't really attack or germs can't take you as a host. And then the germ theory says that every germ is going to attack you or you have to be, or you're susceptible to every germ. And the reason why this is important uh, to understand is that everybody know, just because you're exposed to a virus or a bacteria doesn't mean that you're going to get sick from that virus or bacteria. And even in the same household, there may be that one person actually gets sick or three people get sick and one person doesn't get sick. And that's because their terrain is stronger and is able to defend itself. And that's the reason why they don't get sick. And so that's, you know, I just want to explain that so that people understand more about how this actually applies here in the holistic dentistry aspect of it. Yeah, that's perfect explanation. I love that. Thank you. Now you asked how I got into all this craziness. Yes. Or the beauty of it. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I'll tell you that was not my intention when I got into dentistry at all. I just wanted to be a normal dentist and have a normal (laughs) practice. And just grow my practice this is not even my first practice. I had a normal practice uh. in Midlothian, Texas, which is a town I dearly, dearly love. So <laughs> turns out as I was opening that practice, I had a toddler at home. I was mm-hmm. working full time as an associate at another practice mm-hmm. and I got sick. Mm. So like so many other holistic practitioners, Mm -hmm. it takes us getting sick Mm -hmm. for the light bulb to go off that we need to stop and take care of ourselves or we can't take care of anybody else. Mm -hmm. So I went through several different doctors and months and months and months of not feeling well Mm -hmm. and was finally diagnosed with Crohn's disease, Wow, which is the best gift that God could have given to me for my career, Mm -hmm. honestly. And that's Um, such a beautiful perspective, right? A lot of times people don't necessarily look at it like that. And I love that you looked at it as a gift and changed your life for not only for yourself, for the better, but also for so many other people because you're such a gift in this community. And I love that you exist and that I could refer patients to you and know that they're going to be well taken care of. And I don't have to worry about that as to what are the things that they're getting in their mouth and coming back with other problems that I need to deal with. So I'm glad too. <laughs> well, I'm glad I'm not creating more work for you to have to fix. <laughs> I mean, seriously, it, it happens. Thing. It really happens. I just saw a patient this Friday. I mean, sorry, yesterday. 
I don't even know like what day anymore. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. I saw a patient. So she has alopecia. And that child has been getting fluoride in her mouth. And I had no idea about this. And I thought that I had educated the patients, I mean, about it, the parents about it. And I'm thinking, okay, you know, they must take care of all these things. And we talk about so many things that it's almost impossible for me to cover every aspect of it and what are the things that they're doing. So she was doing so well. And then she started, the alopecia started coming back again. And I couldn't understand why. And the parents kept saying that we didn't do anything different. Everything is exactly the same. It must be your treatment. We don't understand. Why would this happen? And honestly speaking, I couldn't understand it myself. And then I muscle tested her for her. And then I found out that it's her teeth. And I still couldn't understand what in her teeth. And then we kind of drew a timeline and asked her, when was the last time she went to the dentist? When was the last cleaning? And drew the timeline. And I also was giving her iodine in the past, but I took her off of iodine. And the timeline fell exactly at the same time where she was off of iodine. And she got dental cleaning. And then she also started swimming in a chlorinated pool on a regular basis. And she's been doing since summer of this year. And her spot keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Interesting. Oh, wow. Yes. So things like that. In the past, I wouldn't have necessarily asked those questions. But obviously, the more oh. I know. And then I immediately said, so now I understand even more the significance of talking to every single patient about holistic dentistry and asking them to listen to this podcast so that they can make better choices right away rather than us having to talk about every single thing in an hour consultation. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yes. That's insane. I know. So going back um, to your story. <laughs> hmm. Okay. My story. Let's see. So it was diagnosed with Crohn's disease. Oh, here's the best part. You know, I was health conscious at the time, mm. but holistic anything wasn't really in my vocabulary. Mm -hmm. I was not on the holistic spectrum mm -hmm. quite yet. And um, so my doctors told me that one, that, you know, they gave me my list of medications mm -hmm. that I needed to start taking. So like, you know, you have Crohn's disease. Here's what it is. Right. Here's your list of medications to start. Mm -hmm. Eventually, you're going to need, you know, these medications aren't going to work anymore. And we'll, mm -hmm. we'll put you on stronger medications. And we'll keep doing that until we can't mm -hmm. anymore. And you'll probably at some point need surgery to remove all or part of your colon. Mm -hmm. And that kind of made me mad. Yeah, I didn't accept that answer. Mm -hmm. I was like, well, what about what should I be eating? Mm -hmm. What sort of foods should I eat or not eat? They gave me the diet to help my symptoms, right. but they didn't give me a diet to help me heal. Right. And in fact, they even said, so the GI doc that I liked, mm -hmm. this Harvard-trained gastroenterologist was very, very nice. I liked the man, mm -hmm. but looked me straight in the face and said, your diet has nothing to do with this. I know. That's the most insane thing I've ever heard, it's especially insane. for Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, like a gut problem and you say food has nothing to do with it. Yeah. So that made me, thankfully, that made, you know, alarm bells go off in my head that that, that can't be right. Mm -hmm. And I just don't accept that answer. Mm -hmm. So I got online and did all the research I could do and, you know, started looking into all these different holistic groups and different holistic methods and things were working and I was getting better. Mm -hmm. I did take the medications and I'm very thankful because mm -hmm. that triggered me to get into remission pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. But then it was up to me to do the real work to actually right. heal right. so that I could get off the medications. Mm -hmm. So the more I started going down those rabbit holes mm -hmm. and learning about what Crohn's actually is mm -hmm. and what it takes to heal. Mm -hmm. Man, it's the same thing that I treat at work every day. Right. It's all about inflammation mm -hmm. and your microbiome. Mm -hmm. It's all just a dysbiosis. Right. And that's exactly what tooth decay and gum disease is. Yeah. It's all about balancing the bacteria correctly, mm -hmm. making sure you minimize your inflammation. Mm -hmm. So if I didn't figure out, I was feeling so much better mm -hmm. by this point that I just felt like a hypocrite if I didn't figure out how to do the same thing for my patients mm -hmm. who are dealing with their chronic illnesses mm -hmm. of tooth decay and gum disease. 
So that's what started me on the path to learning more about oral systemic health because that really wasn't taught that much Mm -hmm. in dental school even. And then the more I got into oral systemic health and doing research along that, the more I started saying things to my patients about their diet Mm -hmm. and really digging in a little bit deeper. And my patients are the ones who pushed me the rest of the way. Mm -hmm. Because when I would start talking about diet, Mm -hmm. Some of them would say, okay, well, if you believe this, then why are you still using fluoride? Ah. And if you believe this, why are you, you know, what are you doing with these mercury fillings Mm. that you're taking out? Mm. We know you don't place them, but aren't you still stirring up a bunch of mercury? Mm. So my patients challenged me (laughs) to keep learning Mm -hmm. and man, it's like once you get to a certain point, you kind of can't go back. Right. And I think once I really felt like there were problems with fluoride to where I had an ethical problem using it on my patients, Mm -hmm. once I got to that point, Mm -hmm. I couldn't really be a normal dentist anymore. (laughs) You became an extraordinary dentist. (laughs) Who wants to be ordinary when you can be extraordinary, right? I'd much rather be extraordinary, sure. Exactly. (laughs) But, you know, that's such a powerful story. I love that story because I see day in and day out so many people that actually accept that as their final diagnosis and their treatment option. And it's so heartbreaking for me when I hear a patient. I mean, thankfully, many a times, obviously, they are in my office. So even if they don't believe it, somebody forced them to be there, you know. And every time I would talk about diet, they'd be like, For Crohn's, my GI told me that there's nothing I can do about my diet in order for me to heal. And it is so hard because it's an uphill battle at that point in time. You didn't accept it, you rejected it, but when the patient has accepted it, then to actually make them see another way takes a lot of effort. And I applaud you, even when you didn't know better to say, no, I reject that idea that they say that I don't have the ability to heal because every single one of us have the ability to heal from everything, just like a cut on the skin. And I love that not only did you take that and make it your own in the sense, you got a healing story out of this, you healed your own body through all of this, but then you applied that to your patients and to your practice. And I'm sure it came with a lot of challenges, going down the rabbit holes many times and things like that. Because that's what happens, you know, in this whole field, you know, you keep learning and you keep finding out like iodine was something that happened to me like that. You know, I found out about that and I was like, whoa, that's another rabbit hole. And then you get out of that another rabbit hole and you keep going through these rabbit holes all the time. (laughs) Yes, they do. They do. And it's wonderful. Keeps our brains sharp, right? We are actually able to. (laughs) That's right. So it's wonderful. But I am so thankful for your Crohn's too. I'm so thankful that you're also healed. (laughs) <laughs> but I'm thankful that you know, that's what the wake up call was. <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely thankful that I'm not in the bathroom 12 times a day anymore. Oh, yeah, that, <laughs> that, that is terrible. Of. That is terrible. Nobody needs that. And no. you know, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy about that. So when you say holistic dentistry, does it mean that you do something more than what a dentist would do? The sense that is there certain kinds of things on a regular basis when they come in? Like a regular dentist will do these things and then an extraordinary dentist like you will do these things differently or extra. I love this new label that you've given me. I know, right? I'm going to take it and I'm going to use it. I'm going to post it in my office somewhere. Yes, post it. (laughs) Uh, So so yeah, the difference is that patients will notice when they come into the office Mm -hmm. Is So it does go beyond just not using fluoride. Mm -hmm. We actually make sure and we have to go through our materials pretty regularly because it's not on packaging typically Mm -hmm. for dental supplies. Tell me more. What does it mean? We don't have fluoride in the office, Uh but if we don't regularly check all of our products, Mm -hmm. then it's easy for it to sneak in because they don't, there aren't ingredients listed like on the back of our composite Mm. material Mm. or on even, I was so mad one day I realized that it was in our 
children's flossers that we were giving out to kids, like fluoride on flossers. So we had to throw those out and source them differently. So we don't have any fluoride in the office. We filter it out of our water as soon as it comes in Mm -hmm. and none of our products or materials have it. So and what so is the bad part about fluoride? As a dentist, I would like you to, you know, give out your opinion on why shouldn't people use fluoride after dental cleaning or even in their toothpaste, in their maybe mouth rinses, what other sources, and their water, why shouldn't there be fluoride? Well, I definitely have a stronger feeling about it in water than I do in topical dental products. Mm-hmm. Fluoride is a tool. It's a naturally occurring substance, Mm -hmm. and it was found to be a helpful tool Mm -hmm. in preventing tooth decay to a certain degree, Mm -hmm. but most of those benefits are when it's applied topically, Mm -hmm. not when you're taking it internally Mm -hmm. and getting it systemically. Mm -hmm. So it can be useful. And I'll give you like the safe dental school ADA answer. There's no proof that fluoride causes any kind of negative health problems. Okay. However, mm-hmm. now let's get to what Tony, the mom, right. <laughs> thinks. It needs to be safe and effective. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about efficacy first. Mm-hmm. We've been treating our water mm-hmm. with fluoride mm-hmm. for more than 50 years right. in a lot of cases, mm-hmm. more than 70 years since you know World War II era right. in a lot of cases. And the rate of decay in the country, especially in poor areas, continues to rise. Right. So how efficacious is it? Right. But so there's a problem with fluoride that isn't necessarily talked about. Even topical fluoride is the iodine depletion. And we exactly. have a huge yeah. hypothyroidism epidemic. Yes. And then children are getting diagnosed with hypothyroidism. Newborns. I actually have a newborn with hypothyroidism. This is a That's huge, insane. That is. I mean, I was actually talking about this with my mentor. And, you know, he has 40 years experience, right? And I have almost 20 years experience. And none of us have ever seen a newborn with hypothyroidism in all these years. And here we are seeing newborns with hypothyroidism. So even though it hasn't actually prevented tooth decay, now we actually have a rise in hypothyroidism. And I see so many people, even without hypothyroidism, but on the verge of hypothyroidism, who are super iodine deficient, even yes. chronic, you know, fatigue is actually... Yeah many a times because of iodine deficiency. And so fluoride does contribute heavily to iodine deficiency. So it's almost like, you know, we put fluoride to prevent tooth decay. And one of the biggest reasons for me that, you know, I don't want my patients to use fluoride is because of that, because yes, it may help a little bit, but then if it's actually going to cause this much damage, then I don't really want something like that. If What if we can use something else instead of fluoride that can be effective, but without causing the damage, then that's what we want. Exactly. It's all about risk versus benefit. Yes. What will really make steam come out of your ears, if it hasn't already, about the fluoride situation is there are currently 76 peer-reviewed published scientific studies that are linking water fluoridation to a decrease in IQ. Yes, I know that. And yes, for the listeners, yes, it is. And it's crazy. So that's been in the holistic community for years and years. Right. The tinfoil hat people that would say, oh, it's just the government trying to dumb down the population. Right. What in the world are these 76 studies about? And I get it. You know, I've had friends that have said, oh, well, most of those are small studies. They're not done in in this country. Right. Blah, 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 blah. There's 76 freaking studies (laughs) about it. So if there are 76 studies that are showing that there's a correlation, then it's going to make me pause. Correct. And say, maybe there's something here and maybe the risk outweighs the benefit correct because the benefit's not that much yes if it hasn't done anything in the two dk then it really isn't even beneficial that much right and, like and so, why are we wasting our time right yeah and what do you use so since you know we are talking about fluoride and you know maybe the topical fluoride does have some benefits what do you use instead of that so that you know you're still getting the benefit but without all the ill effects of it Yeah. So we use several things. 
for patients at home, mm -hmm. I want them using a toothpaste with a very specific form of calcium. Mm -hmm. If they can find it, mm -hmm. you know, preferably a nanoparticle calcium hydroxyapatite. Mm -hmm. That is found in your best remineralizing toothpaste. Mm -hmm. If it's in that nanoparticle, then your enamel can actually absorb it and mm -hmm. take that into the crystalline structure. And it that is the crystalline structure that our enamel is made up of. Mm -hmm. So the nanoparticle calcium hydroxyapatite, it's typically a natural source. So I feel very good about the safety profile of it. It's been used for decades and decades and mm -hmm. is very accepted in the scientific literature as well. Mm -hmm. So benefits there. That's wonderful. Um, so since we are talking home, about toothpaste, I do have one more question. Are yeah. there some things that people should look for in the toothpaste that shouldn't be there and that should be there? Yes. So toothpaste is primarily cosmetic. Mm -hmm. You don't necessarily need it. It's really just a way to. Oh my God, a dentist saying that toothpaste is not necessary. Oh my goodness, <laughs> you're making history here. <laughs> it's not necessary. The ADA actually says that the primary purpose of toothpaste mm -hmm. is as a carrying agent for fluoride. Ah, wow, so, I didn't know that. If we're not really using the fluoride, if it's not really serving the purpose, then toothpaste is is a nice cosmetic because you want it to have a, enough of a grit that it removes the plaque from the surface of the teeth, mm -hmm. the soft plaque. Mm -hmm. But that's the primary purpose. Wow. Now you can, it's I think it's a wonderful cosmetic to use and I recommend it. Mm -hmm. I recommend that patients use toothpaste. But it's to carry other things now. Ah. So it's to carry our calcium hydroxyapatite. Mm -hmm. And it's to carry some xylitol if you can tolerate xylitol. Because mm -hmm. that's a wonderful tool to help prevent tooth decay and rebalance the oral mm -hmm. microbiome. Mm -hmm. Now, what I don't want to see in toothpaste is we don't need a ton of foaming agents. Mm -hmm. So the sodium lauryl sulfate... Those kinds of things are, are really not necessary. Even though we like them, we like that foamy feeling. Mm -hmm. It's not needed. Mm -hmm. um, is there any, I, is there any uh, cons to having that SLS? That would be a question for our naturopath, my dear. <laughs> I think SLS, it's not needed, but my understanding is there are some allergies to yes. it. It can create some sensitivities. Yes. But you tell the listeners, because I'm sure you... <laughs> can articulate much better than I can. Yes, SLS is not only not necessary, it can definitely create certain kinds of intolerances and allergies. And because we do have to understand that even though we are actually putting it in our mouth, we have lymphatic system that absorbs everything that we put in our mouth. And everything that you put in your mouth is in your body. You have to understand it's not just in your mouth. So which means that every ingredient in your toothpaste as well as your oral rinse matters. If it is absorbed into your lymphatic system and goes into your tissues, is that actually going to do you any good or is it actually going to do you any bad? And that's what we want to look at. An SLS always gets into the lymphatic system and gets accumulated, causes the immune system to react poorly later and creates intolerances to things that they shouldn't be reacting to that are commonly present in the nature, like allergens, you know, like, I'm mean, not allergens, they're called pollens, but we now call them as allergens, unfortunately, but, you know, pollen and things like that. So it triggers an immune system response that we don't want. So SLS is not good to have in the toothpaste. Preach it, sister. I like it. <laughs> okay, so what else do we not want in the toothpaste? We don't want a bunch of chemicals and plastics and weird stuff. Mm -hmm. For a while, they were putting literal plastic beads Wow. in toothpaste. Oh, yeah, I remember like Colgate used to have that. I remember yes. like blue beads. Oh, my, oh they are plastic? They're oh my plastic. God. I've used them. Oh my God. And it's one of those like forever chemicals. So oh it gosh. never goes away. <sighs> I think they stopped it because I think there were enough people that complained about the ick factor of why are you putting plastic in our toothpaste? Wow. Um, but yeah, they were little plastic beads. Wow. And so sometimes hygienists would like find them embedded in gum tissue Ooh. if, you know, you scrub too hard in the wrong direction or something. Um, 
So we don't want to see anything like that. <laughs> it, you don't need fake scrubbers. That's just weird. Like, there's plenty of natural scrubbing agents that can be used in toothpaste to help mm-hmm. scrub your teeth if mm-hmm. that's your jam, mm-hmm. if that's what you want. <laughs> I also don't like... What else was in it? There were some... It's Sorbital. been so long since I've Sorbital. looked at normal toothpaste. How about Sorbitol? There were... Say that again? Sorbitol. Sorbitol. You know, that one's interesting. Love Sorbitol. Mm -hmm. And I think there's even some scientific evidence that if you have Sorbitol combined with Xylitol, Mm -hmm. that it reduces the effectiveness of the Xylitol. Correct. And usually Sorbitol is typically not from a plant source, right? Yes. And also, I mean, from what I have learned is Sorbitol, it's kind of interesting. Sorbitol acts like a cake. Is mm. what I have learned, even though it's kind of sugar alcohol, but it really promotes the pathogenic growth in the mouth and not really reduce the pathogenic growth like xylitol does. And that just was wow. very interesting to me because almost every single regular drugstore toothpaste has sorbitol as their first ingredient. Yeah. Well, it's so cheap to produce, I yes. think. Yes. I think it actually comes from corn, if I'm not wrong. Or it, I could be completely wrong. Oh, does wrong. it? I think so. I know I'm not even sure. A lot of xylitol comes from corn, so right. it wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. So that's what I think it is. But it's crazy. But the way it acts is just how horrible that is. And it was horrifying for me to recognize that and say, oh my God, something that we are using in our toothpaste after we eat our desserts acts as a dessert. <laughs> So that, you know, all night long, we have pathogenic overgrowth in our mouth. We are thinking that we are, you know, kind of protecting our own teeth at night after brushing. Right. It. <laughs> so that's crazy. Awesome. Yes. Okay. Yes. So we talked about toothpaste. So let me ask you one more question. What are the common myths about taking care of your oral health? Well, the first one we've kind of already, I spilled the beans a little early on. The first one is that you need toothpaste because uh-huh. you don't. Uh-huh. necessarily need toothpaste so if you don't um, need toothpaste what is the scrubbing agent like how does it work really the toothbrush bristles wow. are doing the bulk of the work for you okay so that's why why we tell kids a lot of time or parents of really small kids and toddlers you can just get a toothbrush with some water on it mm. and use that on your children's teeth and that is typically just fine okay and how do you feel about activated charcoal as toothpaste as well as our you know as a tooth powder if you will or baking soda for tooth mm-hmm. powder as well as hydrogen peroxide for you know using as well because a lot of natural community people do those kinds of things and I want to hear your opinion on that yeah I don't mind them for the most part mm-hmm. uh, I know my grandparents used to use baking soda and that was their only toothpaste Mm. for a period of time. Mm -hmm. They just dipped a a wet toothbrush in some baking soda and used it. The only bad thing about some of them is the particle size. And typically in baking soda, it's going to be a little too coarse Mm -hmm. and is going to be more abrasive than we want it to be and will wear away the enamel a little bit. So I usually say if you really like baking soda and like the taste of baking soda, which I do, I kind of like that taste, Okay, then it's better for you if you dissolve it in some water and Ah. or use it like as a mouthwash that way and rinse with it because then you're raising the ph of the saliva Mm -hmm. it has a lot of benefits i just don't like for it to be used as a scrub every day yeah now with bentonite clay and activated charcoal those tend to be finer mm-hmm. of a grit. And so I don't mind those as much. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it really, like, I would kind of want to see the patient's enamel first. Ah. So on most patients, I would say it's probably fine to do several times a week. A lot of times on kids in that preteen age range, mm-hmm. their teeth tend to get a little dingy, mm-hmm. especially when they're, they've got a combination of permanent teeth and baby teeth mm-hmm. at the same time. Mm-hmm. For some reason, they miss the ones in the front and things start to look kind of funky in mm-hmm. there. And so I'll usually tell moms, you know, they're, they're really too little to talk about whitening their teeth, but once or twice a week, mm-hmm. get in there with some activated charcoal, brush with it, it does a nice job and their teeth are white and beautiful, just like they're supposed to be. Oh, that's awesome. That's such a nice tip. 
And how do you feel about hydrogen peroxide? Peroxide as a rinse, I love it. Mm -hmm. So it's got such it. a it's such really, an inexpensive really rinse, right? That'll be as effective. Absolutely. Awesome. Now I don't. It's not as enjoyable <laughs> yes. as some other rinses. Yes. If you've ever rinsed with with normal three percent hydrogen peroxide, mm -hmm. it foams, but then it keeps foaming mm -hmm. for like a good five minutes or more <laughs> after you spit it out. So it's not the most enjoyable experience. Uh -huh. It's not that it tastes bad; it just doesn't taste all that good. Yeah. But you can get, there are some over-the-counter, especially in the health food store, there are some mouthwashes that have hydrogen peroxide as an ingredient, mm -hmm. or you can dilute hydrogen peroxide yourself. Just mm -hmm. make sure it's food-grade mm -hmm. peroxide mm -hmm. and not just the stuff in the yucky brown bottle. Right. And you can do it yourself, and it's very tolerable mm -hmm. that way, I would say. Okay. But yeah, clinically speaking, I love, love, love peroxide. We use it in several different ways. It's effective at killing the most insidious mm -hmm. gum disease causing bacteria. Mm -hmm. So I really love it clinically speaking. Awesome. I love it. So how about brushes, toothbrushes? Is there a specific kind of toothbrush that people need to use or is there something that they need to know about toothbrushes that before they purchase them for the best oral health? I love this question. I get it every day, mm -hmm. obviously. Mm -hmm. I don't, you might not love the answer because I still, I have yet to find a natural product that compares with a Sonicare toothbrush. Mm. It's a big brand. It's a big, huge company. I don't want to love it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How about Burst? I, what do you think about Burst? I haven't found anything better. And so what I tell patients is if you're going to use a manual toothbrush, mm -hmm. if you're going to use an old school manual toothbrush, which is fine, you mm -hmm. can do a perfectly fine job with one, then I would say, yes, look for bristles that are more natural. Mm -hmm. If you can find silver impregnated bristles, that's really lovely. If you can find uh, natural bristles that have a bit of a taper, mm -hmm. a tapered bristle is mm -hmm. very nice and soothing to the gum tissue. That's lovely. And then obviously if you can find something with a bamboo handle mm -hmm. or something that's sustainable, mm -hmm. then that's great for the environment. And I love that. Mm -hmm. As far as function and the results that I see, mm -hmm. if you have trouble with plaque buildup at all, mm -hmm. then as far as the effectiveness of your toothbrush, you tend to get what you pay for. Mm -hmm. So a $10 or $15 spin brush usually does a better job than a manual toothbrush. Mm. And a $50 Oral-B usually does a better job than a spin brush. Mm. And a $100 Sonicare, typically the results that I see does better than anything else. So what do you think about Burst? Because they have those activated charcoal bristles and they have thinner, finer bristles that... Yeah. I really wanted to love it so, so bad. <laughs> I love the bristles. And I even tried, I I was like, well, maybe they just weren't thinking and they made the attachments where I could put a burst head on my Sonicare. Uh -huh. They didn't. <laughs> um, I wanted to love it so bad. Mm -hmm. The packaging is adorable. I'm such a sucker for sleek <laughs> packaging and they have the sleek packaging but it the doesn't. vibration is not there. The ah. effectiveness is not there. So the effectiveness comes from the vibration of the toothbrush rather than the bristles? Well, it's both, but Sonicare's fine-tuned the vibration so much over ah. so many years that you can you can even like watch it under a microscope. You can ah. hold a Sonicare toothbrush up against your teeth mm -hmm. and you can see the pulsing, like pushing the water through the teeth into the other side. Wow. wow. Like they really have it down. Wow, that's cool. That's awesome. I mean, as long that's as we cool. have something out there that can do the job, right? I mean, that's what it is. Yeah. It's not about, yes. oh, you know, we want to support specifically one thing or the other. Whatever is effective is what we want to support and educate. Right. Of. That's great. How about the PP toothbrushes, like the manual ones? Oh, those are great. 
I hygienists them. love those. Yes. And they have all kinds of different sizes mm -hmm. and different varieties. Mm -hmm. Those are fabulous. So if somebody is going to use a manual toothbrush, would you recommend them to use something like that in order for them to get to different areas of their mouth and also having different habits even within their brushing right because you know you do the same thing all the time you know we brush our teeth almost all the time the same way we don't really think about it it's just an unconscious process that we do with and so i mean i always recommend and advise and encourage my patients to meditate while they are brushing their teeth so that they can pay yeah, attention to every single that. tooth right so i'm like if you want to meditate and a lot of people ask me how do you meditate i don't know how to meditate i tell them you know what starting today you know when you brush your teeth tonight you know, focusing on every single tooth. And that's your meditation. You know, that's where we start. <laughs> that's so great. I love that. <laughs> so, yes, because of that, the TP toothbrushes, I know they actually have different heads and different sizes. So would mm -hmm. that be a good idea for people to get and use them at different times so that they kind of become more mindful of the practice of brushing itself? Yeah, absolutely. And anytime you can clean in between the teeth, mm -hmm. I think is a good thing mm -hmm. because it's not, it's not all about floss more. Mm. So yeah, I like, so TP is good. We give to our patients a lot of time, these little things by the company called gum. They're Proxa brushes. Mm. What and are Proxa brushes? They're, they're these super cute, tiny <laughs> little brushes that'll stick in your pocket and it almost looks like a little Christmas tree on a wire. And so you can bend it and make it go any direction you want to go. But that's great if you've got spaces in mm. between your teeth or like under a bridge or around some different dental work. Um, this isn't fair, or, Dr. Ingram. I haven't gotten one still. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I'll send you some. <laughs> <laughs> I need to have Christmas trees in my life. Right? Yes. Doesn't everybody? Yes, for sure. Wow, that sounds cool. Okay, that's awesome. I love, love all of the things that you're sharing. So using a toothbrush, the right toothbrush, using the right mm -hmm. toothpaste, using mm -hmm. an oral rinse, and is there anything else that we need to floss? So out of all of these things, if let's say that we have to simplify the dental oral health into certain you know steps, how would you you know tell people to do that? Well, it depends because I like to meet patients where they are. Mm -hmm. If I tell every patient to brush and floss and rinse and use these special gadgets More and perfect. scrape their tongue, it's <laughs> probably not going to happen. <laughs> but for my very compliant patients, mm -hmm. I will say, yes, brush, mm -hmm. clean between your teeth somehow, mm -hmm. whether that's with floss or a water pick mm -hmm. or a TP brush mm -hmm. or a Proxa brush, however mm -hmm. that is. Mm -hmm. And then if you need a little bit of backup, then also use a rinse mm -hmm. and scrape your tongue. Okay. So those are the four steps that people need to know to keep their oral health healthy. Yep. And then I have one other question that we didn't talk about before is gum diseases. You know, that's actually a big deal, especially older population. Not that it's not amongst young, but as we get older, I see a lot of gum issues because we do the thermography as well, regulatory thermography in our practice, and we see the teeth, obviously, and that's the reason why, you know, we send those patients to you because they need your help. But for gum health, what are the things that people can do to prevent gum diseases? Hygiene-wise, mm -hmm. it's exactly what we've already talked about. Okay. It's remove the plaque to some extent. Mm -hmm. It's clean between the teeth. It's clean the tongue. Do a rinse if you can do a rinse. Especially, you know, rinses I think are, I like them more for preventing gum disease than mm -hmm. for preventing cavities. Uh -huh. They can be effective at both, but right. that's really the main thing mm -hmm. is helping to prevent and treat gum disease. But gum disease is interesting because it's so inflammatory mm -hmm. a lot of times, mm -hmm. but it's an inflammation that we don't necessarily feel mm -hmm. until it's too late, right. until it's in a severe state. Mm -hmm. So inflamed gum disease, when it's really painful, usually that only shows up in our younger people mm -hmm. and it shows up when they come in for a cleaning and they think that me or my hygienist hurt them when we clean. We're like, 
no, right. <laughs> we're not doing anything different. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're inflamed. Your gums are so sick. It's bleeding. It it's bleeding. That's how you, they actually recognize that. Yeah, bleeding mm -hmm. and a lot of time and painful in that condition sometimes. So anyway, the anything that will help calm down inflammation will help prevent gum disease. So again, we go back to it's diet first. If you're eating processed foods and fast foods and omega-6 fats that are inflammatory and fake foods and all the things that we in this country, well, and everywhere, all of the Western world tend mm -hmm. to eat, mm -hmm. then you're going to be more inflamed. Mm -hmm. And for some people, that inflammation shows up in the mouth. So mm -hmm. it's talking about diet a lot of times. And it's talking about stress and hormones and all of those things that can contribute. Awesome. You have given a lot to think about. So I have a few more questions. When is it necessary for someone to visit a dentist? I gotcha. You said, when is it necessary? And so my, my first thought is it's always necessary. Yes, that's exactly the question, <laughs> really. That it is, I mean, you don't have to wait well, until you have a problem to go visit please a dentist. Please don't. Right. Yeah. Yes. Because most dental things don't hurt right away. Mm -hmm. So if you wait until you're hurting, until you have a problem, then a lot of times it, my options to fix you are not very fun options. Mm -hmm. So for many people, I would say a majority of people coming twice a year for checkups to do a cleaning, that's, that's kind of your standard go to. Mm -hmm. And I still like that interval that every six month interval for most people. Mm -hmm. Now, some people are very, very healthy mm -hmm. and very low risk mm -hmm. and take care of things very nicely on their own. Mm -hmm. And so they don't necessarily have to come in every six months. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell them, you know, you have graduated the school of Dr. Ingram. Ah. <laughs> so, and you can come in only once a year. Wow. But what's funny is that those are the people who want to come in more often just because <laughs> they like the feel of clean teeth. So and those I've are the people probably anybody also who, want to take uh, care of their teeth better, right? That's the reason why they yeah. want to come in. Yes. Yes. Now, also, what's important to know is that if there is a problem that if you've got gum disease, seeing you twice a year is not enough. Mm. Like it takes time. Mm. It takes time to heal. And so we go through just like you and your patients when they're sick, mm -hmm. you don't just say, okay, do these things and I'll see you in six months. Right. That doesn't work. Right. Like we need this regular cadence mm -hmm. of let's apply these medications mm -hmm. and then Let's see how the body responds mm -hmm. and then let's tweak and let's do these healing modalities and see how the body responds. So there are some more frequent visits in the beginning mm -hmm. if we've got a patient who has a problem mm -hmm. that we need to get through and solve. And it's worth solving because there's so many health issues right. that are linked to gum disease, especially. Yes. Heart disease is one of them, major one mm -hmm. that we need to talk about. Okay. That's awesome. So what is your opinion on root canals as well as mercury fillings? Well, root canals are a wonderful way to take people out of an emergency situation. Mm -hmm. You know, if a nerve is inflamed to the point that it's becoming necrotic or it is irreversibly inflamed, mm -hmm. then a root canal can be a way to get you out of pain quickly Mm -hmm. and to save the tooth. Mm. So that's a wonderful thing. However, mm -hmm. root canals are, for one, they're not always successful. Mm -hmm. And when they do fail, which many of them do, mm -hmm. when they do fail, they tend to attract some more insidious bacteria mm. than they originally did. Mm. You know, when you do a root canal, you remove the nerve of the tooth that gets you out of pain. Mm -hmm. But you also, in doing that, you're removing the blood supply mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. So now there's no blood flow to that area. So mm -hmm. the body can't naturally take care of that mm -hmm. and do the healing that it needs to do. It doesn't have that opportunity. Mm -hmm. So you get like the, the oxygen hating mm -hmm. creepy crawly mm -hmm. bacteria mm -hmm. that are 
in that area. Mm-hmm. And obviously in the holistic community, you can go down many, many rabbit holes around root canals mm-hmm. where coincidentally, mm-hmm. some people get a root canal and get sick. Yes. And we see that time and time again. Mm-hmm. And then also coincidentally, mm-hmm. some people remove their root canal treated tooth. Mm-hmm. They remove the tooth and for whatever reason, that allows some symptoms to resolve. Yes. And so it is it, so common actually, because obviously, as you said, the insidious creepy crawlies in there are getting into the lymphatic system and making them sick as you know, overall. And naturally, when we take that out and we don't have that anymore, the lymphatic system isn't burdened by these pathogens anymore. Naturally, the body is able to detoxify better from that. It's otherwise a systemic infection that started in the mouth. Right. Yeah. Isn't that so interesting? So that, I mean, the science is slowly, it will be very slow to catch up with the holistic community. Right. Because the holistic community has been preaching this for many, many years, but we do know that there was a a really powerful and interesting study in the journal circulation. It's the journal of the American Heart Association. Uh And in that study, they took a hundred patients and this was maybe 2015, 2016 Uh that the study came out. Uh They took a hundred patients who were having a heart attack. Uh They were in the middle of a heart attack, they needed intervention in a hospital setting. Mm -hmm. And so the doctors on staff removed the clots that were causing the heart attacks, the clots in the coronary arteries and looked at those clots under a microscope. Mm -hmm. And it was over 70% of those clots had bacteria that come from root canal infections, Mm -hmm. from tooth borne infections. There were Many of them, a large percentage of them that had gum disease causing bacteria as well, Mm -hmm. but far more had these root canal Mm -hmm. type of bacteria that were in there, Mm -hmm. endodontic born tooth bacteria. Yeah, I mean, that's incredible. And there is also, there has been research that also shows that root canals and the bacteria that are associated with the root canals that have been done, and then they are actually still growing and moving into the lymphatics also causes lymphatic blockage to the same side of the breast, contributing to more breast cancers as well. So they actually found, I think in the study, that 98% of women who had breast cancer also had a root canal on the same side of the jaw. So, uh, sorry, 93%, not 98%, but that's a huge percentage, you know? huge. Right. Yeah. And what do you think about mercury fillings? A lot of people have them, and I know you actually do the safe removal of mercury, which is also very important that it needs to be removed that way and it should not be removed in a callous manner because you can actually get the mercury into your system. But what are the ill effects of having mercury fillings? Is that something that people need to take out if they have one? And also another question that a lot of people ask me is, well, I've had it for 20 years. I've had it for 30 years. What does it matter now? You know, like if I've had it for so long, why do I have to take it out now? So what would your answer be for that? Yeah. So it goes back to our discussion again about the terrain and how healthy is the terrain of the patient. Mm -hmm. And so it's really interesting and that I see it's the same with root canals Mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. Like I'll see some people who have a mouth full Mm -hmm. of mercury, a mouthful of root canals, Mm -hmm. and they're doing just fine Mm -hmm. and they feel good. Mm -hmm. And so in those patients, I'm, I'm not going to push them to do dentistry that they don't Mm -hmm. want or feel like they need. But in some people, yeah, it can trigger some weird and crazy things. Mm -hmm. But again, the scientific literature hasn't been able to, to directly connect them Mm -hmm. yet. Mm -hmm. But There are some interesting coincidences Mm -hmm. that make you really think. So with the amalgam fillings, in dental school, that's what we're taught to call them. Amalgam Mm -hmm. is because they're an amalgamation. They're a mixture Mm -hmm. of 50% mercury and 50% other metals, you know, Ah. silver, tin, zinc, other things. And in the old days, dentists used to mix those with their hands. That's why I think... So many people, you know, in the 80s, 90s, and even today Mm -hmm. are like, the mercury is no big deal. Right. We're, you know, at least we're not mixing it with our hands Mm -hmm. anymore. Mm -hmm. So. (laughs) Is that still accepted by ADA to put mercury fillings in? 
Yes. Yes? It is. Wow. It is. I think at the urging of the FDA, Uh the FDA has now said that you should use caution in placing them in pregnant women and children. Wow. So that's the only caution that is. As far as they've gone. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Obviously, there's a lot of politics involved and a lot of just old habits die hard. Mm -hmm. It's Mm -hmm. a great restorative material it's Mm -hmm. easy to use Mm -hmm. it lasts a long time right um and it's really inexpensive Mm -hmm. so it's a good restorative material that in most people for a long time it did just fine in but yeah again you might have a 30 year old female Mm -hmm. who gets one Mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden she's got these weird neurological problems right. because mercury is a very potent neurotoxin. Right. We know that mercury is a neurotoxin. Yeah. And it's just that in dental school, that. we were taught that it was inert. Yeah. Once yeah. we put it's it not. in a tooth, we yeah. were taught that it stays and that now it's chemically different and right. it doesn't go anywhere. Yes. And on top but, of it though, if we think about the correlation too, right, you know, Even though generally they say causation doesn't mean, you know, correlation. I mean, correlation doesn't mean causation. But I like to look at these things. Like now we have the most amount of memory care centers than ever. So Mm. Alzheimer's, for example, there's a big heavy metal correlation with Alzheimer's. And hearing loss is another one. You know, tinnitus is another one that seems to have a correlation with amalgam fillings. Even though for the moment it doesn't seem like it's doing much and dementia, Parkinson's, all of these neurological disorders that have become more and more and more prevalent seems to be associated with the usage of heavy metals, even though it didn't seem to immediately do. Because I think in the conventional world or the Western world, most times it's like you take something and you have to have an immediate allergic reaction for you to have causation correlation. Otherwise, it's not really considered that way at all. But the number of memory care centers nowadays is just mind boggling to me and how many people in their 70s and 80s are, you know, neurologically not doing well. And these are all people wow. who have had these kinds of fillings. Yeah. Well, and dentists used to have far more neurological problems than oh, wow. we do currently. Oh, wow. I didn't uh, know that. Yeah. I wonder why. <laughs> <laughs> just mix all the mercury by hand and you know, taste it to see it actually tastes perfect before you administer. Right? <laughs> you taste it to see if it looks right. Like when I was looking around and you know, looking at the possibility of buying a practice, there was one practice that I looked at where he had carpet in the treatment rooms. Ah. And he was a, like an old school amalgam filling using, mixing by hand kind of dentist. Uh-huh. So, can you imagine wow. the mercury that would be embedded in that carpet? Okay. Like you can't clean that. Yeah. Wow. That's it. <laughs> so, wow. Yeah. There was some crazy stuff going on. Thankfully, even the ADA, even the dental schools do at least recommend better mercury hygiene than they previously did. Okay. So it's disposed in a certain way. Dental offices are now required to have amalgam separators so that it doesn't go into the wastewater like it used to. Okay. That was actually a very recent thing, just within the last five years okay. that that was required. So it is better. Mm-hmm. And because of better mercury hygiene practices in dental offices, we now only have slightly worse neurological problems than the general population (laughs) oh my god that shouldn't be funny but it's crazy it shouldn't be funny but it is funny (laughs) oh my gosh it's so crazy that when it's so beyond our scope of comprehension you just have to laugh because it just doesn't make any sense it's mind-boggling that you know we do this to ourselves you know we are the only population or the only species that does these kinds of things I think I know we don't learn very easily (laughs) okay so and you obviously don't use correct amalgams and you also remove them in a safe manner which is also very important in order for it to not get into the tissues and so on and so forth right correct okay yeah we use one of the organizations that I'm a part of it's the International Academy of Oral Medicine and Toxicology They developed a protocol for that very purpose, to make sure that the patient is protected as much as possible, to make sure that dentists 
and especially dental assistants Mm. are protected as much as possible from mercury vapors that are released when amalgam fillings are removed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, wow, that's wonderful. I'm glad that there are some practices in place. So the last thing, you know, before I let you go, and I, you know, I have to really, really thank you for being so patient and answering all of these questions that I have had, you know, so that we can educate our listeners. This is fun. We're going for another hour, right? (laughs) See, I love that. I love your enthusiasm (laughs) that you're ready to go for another hour. But I wouldn't take that much more of your time. So the last question (laughs) is, is there anything that you would like for everyone to know about their own oral health? What is it that they should or shouldn't do that can help them have better oral health? I would just encourage people to have a guide. Mm. You can do, your body was meant to heal. Mm -hmm. You can do it. Mm -hmm. You're designed to flourish. Your body was designed to flourish and to heal, but have a guide. What I see, especially serving the holistic community, which I feel so, so grateful to serve. Mm -hmm. They're some of the most educated patients on the planet. Uh They take accountability for their own health, Mm -hmm. which I love, Mm -hmm. but sometimes it's hard for us to, as patients to trust. Mm -hmm. So I would just say, I would encourage whether you're holistically minded or you're just starting to dip your toe in, Mm -hmm. find someone that you trust to be your guide through a process through the process uh, of healing, because it can happen. You can do it. Mm -hmm. Your mouth can heal. You Mm -hmm. can get better, but you don't have to do it alone. And it's really hard to do it on your own. Yeah, I agree 100%. I do. I think in all of us need those guides. It's not like just patients. We all do. All of us do. We all need guides for so many different things. And uh, Ah. especially on the chronic disease spectrum of it, it is, it can be extremely not only challenging, but also very lonely to do it and not really knowing which direction to go and confusing. So I love that. Awesome. Is there anything else that you want to share that I haven't covered to help our listeners? I would just share my gratitude for you. You know, you speak about sometimes healing and going through a healing journey can be a lonely process. Mm -hmm. Well, you have, I I looked through your podcast episodes and listened to many of them. You have story after story after story of different healing journeys. Mm -hmm. So I just thank you so much for having a platform where you give people the space to to heal, but to do it with a community of other people, Mm -hmm. you know, even if it's people that they don't know and may never meet right there, there's community and healing. And I'm just so grateful for you and thankful that you're sharing stories like this. Oh, that is so sweet. Thank you. And I appreciate that you exist and we have such a beautiful community, truly, you know, especially here in Texas. I love Mm -hmm. that We have such a beautiful community that really wants every single one of them to heal. Everybody that comes into those offices, everybody really cares about them deeply and we want nothing but to serve them. And that is the best gift that we all can have. And I love that, you know, I have you and so many other practitioners that I can send patients to and they get all these amazing results. And then now together, we can help people so much better because alone we can never do these things. And I love that we have the community to be able to do this together. I agree wholeheartedly. Thank you so much, Dr. Ingram, for being here. And that's Dr. Ingram, Tony Ingram from Flourish Dental Boutique in Richardson. I really, really, really loved having you and just picking your brain on all of the things so that we could share all these things. Again, you know, as we were talking about earlier, so many times, so many things get missed out. So if we have all of this in one place, I hope that this can help educate and empower people to be able to take better care of their not only oral health, but also their entire body's health. And so thank you everyone for listening. I really appreciate you spending the time to listen to this because I know you have things to do and places to be, but you chose to listen to us. I appreciate you for joining us this time and I hope to see you next time. Thank you. 